to welcome everyone to the evening service here at the Amory Church of Christ. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, Landon is going to start us off with a song. What song? What's your number? 129. And then Reese Cantrell will be leading our singing after that. I'll be singing number 129, Amazing Grace, 129, Amazing Grace, first and second verse. Amazing We're going to say number 875, number 875, we're going to sing the first and the third verse of this song. If for the price we have striven, after our labors are o'er, rest of our souls will be given on the eternal shore. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the beautiful day that you've blessed us with. We thank you for the opportunity we have this evening to gather together and sing songs of praise to you, to study a portion of your word. We pray that, that the things that are said and done here would be in accordance with thy will and that our 
worship this evening would be pleasing and, and acceptable in, in your sight. Dear Heavenly Father, we, we pray for those that have been mentioned that are sick. We pray especially for, uh, for Brother Bill Steverson that his condition would improve. We pray for Logan Stanford and for her family that, that things would, would go well with her, that her condition would improve so that she can, can start treatments as soon as possible. Dear Heavenly Father, for, we pray also for Sister Mary Lois Moore and her upcoming surgery and for, for all the others that, that have needs and, and ailments. We pray your richest blessings on them. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray for the church that meets here at, at Amory. We pray for, for all the members here, for, for everyone, the teachers, elders, deacons, everyone that makes up the body here. We pray that we would all be united in one goal, and that goal is to grow your kingdom, and that is done by showing others the way that we should live by showing others that you live in us. And we pray that you would help us do that in the most effective way. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray for, for Brother Jonathan and his family and Abel and his family we, as they work here with us. We pray that that they would be effective in the things that they do, and we pray that, that we would all strive together with them and, and the things that, that we try to do here at Amory. Dear Heavenly Father, we, we pray for our country at these difficult times. We pray that, that the decisions that are made would be in accordance with your will, that we can live as as peacefully as we can, and that uh, that we can have the the freedom that we have been accustomed to uh, to be able to meet and worship you without fear of any outside interference. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you most of all for your Son Jesus for that perfect life that he lived on this earth for his willingness to leave the glory of heaven and come to this earth, live that perfect sinless life and his willingness to be sacrificed on the cross so that by the shedding of his, his precious blood and through obedience we have hope and eternal home in heaven with you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. <clears throat> If you'd like to mark it, a song of encouragement tonight, it's going to be number 909, number 909. Before our lesson, we're going to sing number 886, and I invite you to stand for this song. <laughs> On Jordan's stormy banks I stand and cast a wishful eye to Canaan's fair and happy land where my possessions lie. We will rest in the fair and happy land by and by just across on the ever.
seated. Good evening. So, I am a preacher starting off the sermon this evening by making a confession. Please don't tell anybody it's embarrassing. But I've made it 28 years in this life. A long time of it. A member of the church. I was raised in it. I've been brought in it. I've been around it my whole life. I've worked for many churches. I have worked at least some for a half dozen or more churches. And I'll confess that up to this 28th year, I have never in my life ever attended a gospel meeting. I've never attended a gospel meeting. What, what do you think about that? Anybody think that? I made it this far and didn't do it, Phil. Can you believe that? You hired this guy. So I am excited for my introduction into what a gospel meeting is, what it means, and how it works for the first time ever in my life. The very first lesson I'll ever hear to gospel meeting will be brought by Brother Glenn Colley. And here's something that's really interesting. Guess where Jonathan's from? Huntsville. Guess who Jonathan had never heard preach in his life until earlier, or at the end of last year? Glenn Colley had never heard it before. But I know it's going to be a treat. I know my introduction to a gospel meeting is going to be great. And I don't think you can get too many lessons in a week from the Bible to grow and to learn about him. So we get to, near to the end of this month, share in these lessons all week long. I encourage you to be a part of it. And I don't know if you've seen it, but I and I think it's Miss Jeanette. You correct me if I'm wrong. But in the car, if you go past her car in the parking lot, I asked, whose car is this? She's got on her windshield or on her uh, back windows pictures of Glenn Colley's face with information about this gospel meeting. I mean, that is passionate. So we could all be doing the same thing. We could be telling our friends. We could be putting it on our windows. We could put signs in our front yards. And she did it free of charge. She printed it herself and put it in her window. Do you know why she does that? She's using every creative juice that she has in figuring out how to share the news of this thing with the community that's around her. Have you been putting in the time? Have you been thinking about it? Have you been using your creative juices? Or do you even care to with your friends that are around you in the community? I encourage us all uh, to be involved with that and to do that very thing. Okay. We're going to be in 2 Chronicles chapter 22, so if you want to, go ahead and turn there. 2 Chronicles chapter 22 is where we're going to be. <coughs> we're in our next lesson in this series. We've been talking about the good ones, the good kings that we see in the book of 1 and 2 Kings and 1 and 2 Chronicles. And up to date, we've talked about Solomon, Asa, and Jehoshaphat. Solomon, Asa, and and Jehoshaphat. Remember, Solomon had one key problem. What was his one key problem? Lust. He struggled with lust. Well, he did a lot of really good stuff, like he prayed for wisdom. He was the, smart, wise, or the wisest man that there ever was. He also struggled with that lust. And then next you had Asa. Asa uh, did a lot of really, really good stuff. Remember, he was so passionate about God that he wouldn't let even family prevent him from following God and submitting to him in the way that he should. But at the end of his life, he hardened his heart towards God and refused to even pray toward him uh, as he suffered with an ailment in his feet. And then you had Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat's two words were divided what? Alliance or allegiance, allegiance. He had a divided allegiance. Jehoshaphat did a lot of really good stuff. First off, he sent out Basically, gospel preachers, <laughs> they sent out and went to the kingdom around them with the book of the law. Levites were leaving the temple and preaching to the tribes and to the people out around Jerusalem who God was, and they began to fear God through a knowledge of him. That's awesome. And he loved unity. He was a huge unity person. He wanted unity with the northern tribes of Israel so bad, he could not stand it. The only problem was he ended up having unity in a broken way, didn't he? And he had unity with the northern tribe when a prophet told him not to do it. So that's who we've covered thus far. Solomon, who struggled with lust. Asa, 
who had that hard heart, and Jehoshaphat, who had a divided allegiance. Those are the three, and tonight we will be with Joash. Joash, his two words are a fickle faith. So if you're following in your study guide, his is a fickle faith, fickle faith. I don't know if you looked in your bulletin last week on the, on the first page of that bulletin. I had a story about this thing called the century plant. Did anybody read that? All right, good, because you're about to get it again. Here we go. There is a plant in the western United States called the century plant. And for 25 years of its lifespan, or, or 29, it will live 30 years, okay? Around about, 30 years. For 29 of its years in life, it will stand about six foot tall. It looks like a big aloe vera plant with these pyres that stand straight into the sky. And then in the last year of its existence, it will send up a shoot 20 or 30 feet high in the air in the middle of it. And on the end of that shoot will be all of these flowers. It will stand like that for a year. And at the end of the year, that pyre will fall over and seeds will scatter in the landscape of the desert around it. Now imagine that. It has conserved its energy, waiting for the precise, most hospitable moment for future generations. And then, in its at last act of life, it reproduces for the only time in its entire lifespan. And it's successful. Entire, like species, whole ecosystems are sustained by this, crazy, uh, by this crazy life cycle of the century plant. I bring that story up to say this. We often fear that we will not have children or the, the impact that we've made that in sharing our faith with these children, will they ever carry the torch on to future generations? Will my child ever get it? And here's the crazy reality about that. We, just like the century plant, might not ever know in our lifetime. And we can't know at all how far the impact through the work that we've done, through the telling people about Jesus that we've done, how many of them will submit to the gospel. We never know all the seeds that we will bear for the kingdom. It's impossible to know, right? Instead, we submit to Jesus, and we trust in him and had faith in him, and we need to keep the faith of that century plant. That was what the whole bulletin write-up was about last week. Well, I gave that little write-up in the... Uh, in the house-to-house, heart-to-heart mail-outs that I sent out when I worked at the Plaza Church. And I got something in the mail from a woman who was 100 years old. And when she saw the century plant and how we needed to have the faith of the century plant, she wrote to me and said, I literally am like that century plant. I'm 100 years old. And I do worry and I do fear if at now, at 100 years old, whether or not my children will ever get it. And I want you to know how much that article meant to me and how I do need to have that faith. I think it's natural for us to want to be able to pass that faith on to future generations. And parents, we just got started, right? We just are getting started. I know the desire and the concerns that I have. That maybe Silas will get it and our little girl will get it, right? That, that desire and that hope for them to be in Jesus never goes away, and I'm reminded of that by this woman who was a century old who told me she had a lot of the same concerns. Are we passing on the torch? The story we're going to look at today in Joash is an interesting one to me because it's a passing on the torch passage. It's a passing on the torch passage, kind of. You'll see what I'm talking about in a minute. Before we get to a story or get to the text, though, I want to give you a little bit of background about Joash and how this has to do with the passing on the torch. Because he was adopted, kind of. He really didn't have the upbringing, the stereotypical upbringing. Certainly not the one that that I had. This is what Joash's life was like. It it read kind of like a soap soap opera. Joash Joash's father was the king of Israel, and when he was young, his father passed away. Well, Joash's grandmother, Granny, uh, she, her name was Athaliah. She was wicked. She was really, really wicked. And she went for a power grab and began to destroy any heirs to the throne. She began to kill all of her sons and all of her grandchildren. It's a really, really rough story. 
And, and what happens is Joash's sister takes him and hides him, okay? She hides him with basically an adoptive father. She hides him with the chief priest who will raise him. And for six years, that granny, Athaliah, would be the queen, the matriarch of the kingdom of Judah. She was that queen, and she ran with a fierce, uh, with fierceness, right? And then one day, when, when he was a young boy, so Joash is young, okay, seven years old, they kill his mother. This is really, this is graphic. I'm sorry to the kids. They kill his grandmother outside of the temple. They make sure not to do it in the temple of the Lord, but outside of the temple and ensure that she is removed from her position. And at the age of seven, catch this, he is seven years old. They come and they make him king of Judah. Imagine that. Imagine being seven and being king. If you were a seven-year-old child and you were placed in the most significant position in the entire world, how much do you think that the boy really did on his throne? Probably not a whole lot. Decisions were probably made for him, and he was brought place to place. But I want you to look with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 23, verses 11 through 15. Let's look at this account together. 1 Corinthians, or, sorry, Corinthians. 2 Chronicles, not Corinthians, man. 2 Chronicles chapter 23, verses 11 through 15. Let's read it together. When they brought the king's son, that's Jehoash, put the crown on him and gave him the testimony, and they proclaimed him king. Jehoiada and his sons anointed him, and they said to him, Long live the king. When Athaliah heard the noise of people running and praising the king, she went into the house of the Lord to the people. And when she looked, there was the king standing by his pillar at the entrance, and the captains and the trumpeters beside the king, and all the people of the land rejoicing and blowing trumpets. And the singers with their musical instruments leading in celebration. And Athaliah tore clothes and cried, treason, treason. Then Jehoiada, the priest, brought out captains who were set over the army, saying to them, bring her out between the ranks, and anyone who follows her is to be put to death with the sword. For the priest said, do not put her to death in the house of the Lord. So they laid hands on her, and they went to the entrance of the house, to the gates of the king's house, and they put her to death there. They eliminated Granny Queen Athaliah by killing her. Instead, they put the seven-year-old king on the throne and they presented him with a copy of this covenant. They gave him this copy of this covenant. I want you to look with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 23. Look at verses 2 through 3. Verses 2 through 3. They went about through Judah and gathered the Levites from all the houses of Judah and the heads of the fathers of the houses of the Israelites and they came to Jerusalem. And all of the assembly came and made a covenant with the king of the house of God and Jehoiada and said, Behold, the king's son, let him reign as the Lord spoke concerning the sons of David. This is the thing you shall do. Essentially, they gave a solemn vow, a covenant. They made an agreement. We will defend the seven-year-old boy with our lives. We will be his subjects and his grandmother will do nothing to harm him. We give our word, and there is nothing that they are going to do that's going to be able to stop that. Here's a problem, church. If something very, very valuable is just given to you, it's just given to you, and you don't do anything to earn it, or you didn't see how it came about, or you had no part in helping it to be conceived, but it was just gifted, do you value the thing that's been gifted to you? Probably not. But if you work for a really long time and you earn and you build and then that covenant and that thing is given to you, then do you value it? Yeah. Well, this young boy is seven and he is gifted the keys to the kingdom, right? It's like the Porsche. It's like the really nice vehicle. He's got this really awesome kingdom and it's given to him when he's young. When you look at covenants in the Bible, You see Abraham, who is a hero in the faith, and while he's given a covenant from God, what did he have that God responded to? His faith, right? He had a faith in God that God gave it to him. And then you see Jacob, his son, and Jacob is given a covenant. And Jacob does what to get that covenant? He swindles it. 
and he steals it away from his brother Esau. And then later in life, you see this wrestling match that an angel or God, or some even say a pre-incarnate incarnate Jesus, right, has with Jacob, and Jacob is renamed to what? Israel, because, what does Israel mean? Wrestles with God. In other words, he had this great, awesome covenant, but he stole it. He didn't invest in it. He wasn't all into it. Instead, it was merely a thing he inherited, merely a thing that was given to him, and he didn't value the covenant the way that he should. Parents, I wonder if sometimes we've got a really special thing. I remember when I was a kid, we had a lot of folks in the congregation I grew up with that were being baptized really young. Like it was kind of a pandemic. Like lots of kids were getting baptized. And so they brought it up to the eldership and they brought it up to the preacher and they're like, we got a little situation going on here. What do we do? And I'll never forget Harold because I was one of the young people that got baptized and I never have been re-baptized, by the way. I made my decision in faith. He said, we should not frown on the fact that we have godly parents that are training up children in the way that they should go. We should celebrate it and we should rejoice in it. How special a problem to have that we have today. How neat is this? Now, you guys have something really neat. It was one of the things that we loved about you the first time that we ever came to this place. It's what we so desperately wanted our children to be involved with is we knew we would ever move again. It would have to be something like what we saw here. You've invested in this hallway and you put so much into the planning of curriculum and all of that. You have, your preacher was up here. Philip came and I, I saw Philip do this. He would lead the kids in these songs and to me that was so special and so neat that the kids looked forward to it and he like with like a grandfather with his grandchildren they all looked at him like that they loved that opportunity to learn from his wisdom right and i see your youth minister and the great work that he's doing with the kids and the money that's being spent expanding the youth room up there and the resources that are being pumped into that because we believe in this i I see lads to leaders and not like one key family, like, but whole family units pouring into this because we believe in this for the children. I, I see our teenagers and they would sit all together over here on one side and it was so special. And I thought, man, I want my kids in it. I want them to be a part of this. I want to raise them up in it. I want them to share in this. This is so special to me. If I could bottle it up and if I could just show Plaza how special this is, what a blessing it could be. And what I wonder, though, is we're, we're serving, we're working so hard in them, we understand what the priority could, should be and, and it needs to be, but I wonder, as they're coming to faith, if they realize all the work that you're doing so that they'll have it, or are they merely inheriting religion because it's the ex expectation that I should have, and since mama and daddy were baptized before me, this is the nat next natural step for me, and it's what I should do too. Or are they keeping faith? Are they taking it because it's something they've developed? Or are they keeping it because it's something that they believe in? Do they have relationship with Jesus, right? Well, Jehoash, how do we get back over to Joash? Jehoash or Joash, Joash is given covenant. He doesn't, he doesn't have faith. He is merely given the keys to this covenant, right? And he doesn't, I don't think, really learn how to walk in faith with God. He doesn't know how to do it, right? There are some good things that he does, though. So I want to I show you some of these things that he does do really well. Look at 2 Chronicles chapter 24, verse 4, and then 8 through 12. 2 Chronicles chapter 24, Verse 4 and then 8 through 12. After Joash decided to restore the house of the Lord, 8 through 12, the king commanded and made a chest and set it outside the gate of the house of the Lord. And a proclamation was made throughout Judah and Jerusalem to bring into the Lord the tax that Moses the servant of God laid on Israel in the wilderness. And all the princes and all the people rejoiced and brought their tax and dropped it into the chest until he had finished it. And whenever the chest had been brought to the king's office by the Levites, 
When they saw that there was money in it, the king's secretary and the officer of the chief priest would come and empty the chest and take and return it to its place. Thus they did it day after day and collected money in abundance. Pause here. Joash's great thing that he does that makes him a good king is he devotes himself into ensuring the temple of the Lord is taken care of. It had been, money had been stolen from the, from the temple. People weren't respecting it in the way that they should have. And they were, they were taking the money and the proceeds and it was being used in broken ways and the temple itself was falling into disrepair. And that upset jo, uh, Joash so much that he, he came up with these new rules. When you enter into the temple of the Lord, you're going to put your, your money in a box that's secure. And only certain people are going to be able to get the money out of that box. And it can only go to certain places. He ensured that the temple money was used in the correct way. You know what I think is interesting? Who adopted Joash from the time of his youth? Where did his sister take him? To the chief priest. You know who chose Joash's wives? You know who chose them for him? The chief priest chose them for him. Which is a common cultural practice in Israel. But the reason they did it was because a parent chose your children for you. When Samson finds this young Philistine woman that he wants to marry, where does he go to get his wife? Who does he ask permission from? Mama and daddy. This is the common cultural practice. Why does he go to the chief priest to get permission to marry his wife? It's because the chief priest was his adopted dad, is what happened. Now, what is Joash passionate about restoring? What is the one thing he does? What is the good thing he does that he wants to restore for Israel? The temple. Now, I don't know this, but it is interesting to me. It makes me wonder. Is maybe the reason his passion is for the temple is because he's been taught to be passionate, particularly about the temple from his adopted dad? Isn't that interesting? So, parents, I don't know who I am to speak to you, but as our children are growing up in the church and they're becoming little disciples, we've got to give them the freedom to figure out what their talents are, the things that they're passionate about, and let them explore it. I think sometimes I want Silas, it would be great, okay, if he could be a little preacher. The video that we took of Silas, when that Ma uh, Madison told me that he was going to be a little boy, and she tricked me. She never records me. I wish I could play it for you now, but I can't. But she tricked me and recorded the reaction I gave. And she told me it was going to be a little boy. Little girls are great. We're about to have one. But my first one was going to be a little boy. And I said, oh, he's going to be tall like your dad. It's going to be great. And I said, and he'll be a little preacher. So that's what I want in my head. But that's not what I really, really want. You know what I want for him? I want him to grow up to be somebody who is passionate about Jesus and his kingdom. And if that means he is a preacher, great. But if it means he's a servant of God in whatever capacity he is, because that's where his passions are, and it's because what he loves, then that's what I want, but that's not what Joash had. Joash had an adoptive dad who was a high priest, a chief priest, who had a little king to raise, and he said, I'm going to make him passionate about what I'm passionate about. He's going to be all passionate about the temple. we got to give them freedom to figure out what it is they're passionate about and not put them into this mold that says, you need to be passionate about these things in the church. Let them figure out what those things are. Then... Joash's story takes a turn, a turn for the worst. This really bad thing happens in his life. I want you to look with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 24, verses 17 through 22. Chapter 24, verses 17 through 22. Joash's adoptive father, the high priest, is about to die. And I want you to see what he does as a result of that. After the death of Jehoiada, the princes of Judah came and paid homage to the king. Then the king listened to them, and they abandoned the house of the Lord, the God of their fathers, and served the Asherim and the idols. 
and wrath came upon Judah and Jerusalem for this guilt of theirs. Yet they sent prophets among those and to bring back to the Lord. This testified, uh, they test, these testified against them, but they would not pay attention. Then the Spirit of God closed Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, the priest, and he stood above the people and said to them, Thus says the Lord God, Why do you break the commandment of the Lord so that, you have, uh, so that you cannot prosper because you have forsaken the Lord and he has forsaken you? But they conspired against him. And by command of the Lord, they stoned him with stones in the court of the house of the Lord. Thus Joash, the king, did not remember the kindness that Jehoiada, Zechariah's father, had showed him, but killed his son. And when he was dying, he said, he said, may the Lord see and avenge. Jehoiada's adoptive father dies. And after his death, Joash does something really hurtful. He turns his back to the faith that his father-in-law had given him. And he does not honor his Lord anymore. As a matter of fact, Jehoiada's son, Zechariah, prophesies to Israel to wake him up. And Joash kills basically his adoptive brother because he wants nothing to do with God. How could he be so passionate about God every day that his mentor was alive? And then when his mentor dies, he walked away from the faith and tried to undo everything that his father did. That's a hard, not fun, really stinky story. But that's what happened with Joash. And I think it might scare some of us. Here's what I want you to see. His two-word sin was fickle faith. Fickle faith. His faith fell away at the end, right? Really, though, he had never established faith. It was never his faith to begin with. What he always had was merely the faith of his adoptive father. And when his adoptive father, when his mentor was gone, his faith went to the wayside and it wasn't important to him anymore. All right. To wrap up, I want to give a few things. I am not wise in parenting. I like just got started at this. And even the idea of talking to parents about their kids uh, sounds absolutely ridiculous to me. But I want to give these from the text, if that's all right. And I think they're from the story uh, that we see here. Here's the first one. Let your kids discover their passions, their talents, and their skills, and let them honor God with them. Don't try to fit them into the mold you want them to belong in, but instead give them the freedom to figure out where they belong in the church. Here's the second thing. Connect them to people in the faith. Get them around as many people as you possibly can. I worked with a youth minister when I was in college, and he had this book he called Sticky Faith. And one of the things that he always prioritized that was very important to him is that he did a class every two years, once every two years, where he combined the parents, the teenagers, and the the teenagers and the parents together for one class so they could talk about things together. Um... He wanted them to be in dialogue with one another. And one of the things that Sticky Faith also said was important is try to have your children at every single possible worship service that you can, every single time. So this youth minister, if he could help it, would not skip a Sunday service for anything. Like he would leave camps early. He would do whatever he had to do to get them back on Sunday. I don't think that's always the answer, but it was a personal philosophy of the Farmington Youth Group because he thought the more interactions their teenagers had with everybody in the church and not just one person like Jehoiada was for Joash, the better. If your parent or your children could point to five people in the congregation that love them and know them by name and has relationship that's meaningful with them, and they're not a parent or a grandpa or a grandmother or a minister, the likelihood of them sticking with the faith increases the number of connections that they have because they're already a part of the church before they leave youth group, right? Uh, And here, here is another one. Let your children ask you tough questions and really put thought into how you'll respond to them. So 
I'll tell you a little bit of my story. I don't like to talk about it often, and I definitely don't like to do it in front of a camera, but I will, I'll, t- I'll tell you this. My, uh, my mother's a member of, ch- of the church, okay? Great, great, Campbellite woman, right? My father was, uh, and I guess still is, Pentecostal. And, and he never really, even to this day, hasn't ever really um, cared to be con- consistent in church. Like, and I would ask him when I was a kid, okay, don't go to church with us. Then go to the Pentecostal church and just go regularly. He wouldn't even go there, right? But you know what my dad was really good at? He knew the Bible. He still knows the Bible really, really well. And he has studied it and he has read it. And I could ask him tough questions and he would answer my tough questions. And he would even give me questions in response. So one was, why do you say amen at the end of a prayer? Or another was, why are you Church of Christ if John was a Baptist? And another was, um, (laughs) let's see another one. Why can't I work? What's wrong with instrumental music? Um, All of these little questions were important to me because they helped me relate to my dad and they gave me the opportunity to defend my faith in a constructive way. My father had no desire to tear me down. He was proud of me studying. He was proud that I loved the church and he didn't want to discourage me from going to church with my mama, but he did say, think. Why are you doing what you're doing? Is it because you do it? Or do you have an answer for why you're doing the things that you've done? So our kids, can they think through this? Have they made their faith their own faith? Or are they just basically riding your coattails and thinking it will get them into the kingdom of heaven? Because you cannot ride coattails into the kingdom of heaven. It doesn't work that way. Jesus don't care who your daddy was if you don't honor Jesus, you know? And if Joash did not honor the Savior, but merely did what his mentor wanted him to do, it was never his faith at all. It was simply the faith of his mentors. It's a scary lesson, but it's one that I think that we need. And if you're a parent this morning and you've got a lot of the same concerns that I do, then I want you to know you're not alone. We're all trying to figure this thing out. There is no perfect solution. But I think that what we do here at Amory, the stuff that y'all are already doing long before here and will continue to do, is a step in the right direction. You've been a great example to me and I love you for it. If tonight you want to submit to Jesus or if tonight you want to confess that you haven't been engaging in the faith but have merely inherited faith from somebody else and want to submit to Jesus today. Then why don't you come forward as we stand and sing.
Thank you, Jonathan, for uh, another good lesson this evening. Um, just a few quick announcements, and you have a closing song? Okay. We'll have our closing song, and then Stephen will uh, dismiss us with a prayer. Uh, just quickly, we'll go over the, the sick list again, and just a couple of announcements. Uh, Brother George Thompson is still recovering from his back surgery. Uh, Sister Mar Mary Lois Moore will be having knee surgery on Tuesday in Tupelo. Uh, Brother Bill Steverson is still in the hospital in Tupelo. Uh, Cohen Cooper is undergoing some tests, and Logan Stanford is uh, still at, at St. Jude, no change from this morning, um, trying to, to get ready to start some treatment soon, hopefully. The um, February 7th, we'll be taking the van to the lectureship at Freed Hardman. Uh, please sign the list on the bulletin board if you'd like to go to that. The van will leave at 7 a.m. Tuesday morning. I think I saw something that the uh, those that are intending to go, I think, need to meet. Okay, uh, Philip wants uh, those that are planning on going to meet up here at the front at the conclusion of services. Uh, then February 10th, there will be the Crew Mystery Progressive Dinner. Uh, that will be this Friday. Please sign the list by this Wednesday, February 8th, if you are interested in doing that. And Elizabeth has the list of characters if you would like to, to look at that. Yes. Yes. Uh, if you've not had the opportunity to take the Lord's Supper, if you go down the hall here, there'll be someone to serve you. Thank you, Mike. Um, the uh, February 12th, there will be an elders and deacons meeting following the Sunday evening service. Uh, so if you will put that on your, your calendar. Also, the Young at Heart trip to eat out that was scheduled for February 12th has been changed to the 19th. Please sign that list if you're interested. Also, the uh, please remember the upcoming gospel meeting, February 20th through the 22nd with Glenn Colley. We're excited that Jonathan's going to finally get to experience that. Um, I think there are some flyers uh, around the, the building if if, uh, if you need any of those, if you need any more, we can get more copies of those made. And uh, that's all the announcements, unless anyone... Yes? I did not, but the... Gotcha, okay. The uh, ladies' class will not meet on Tuesday because uh, a lot of the people will be going to the lectures at, at Freed Hardman. Reese will have our closing song, and then Stephen will dismiss us with a prayer. We'll sing the first and the last verse of number 867. I invite y'all to stand. <laughs> to Canaan's land I am on my way where the soul
Pray with me, please. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight thanking you for the day that you've given us, thanking you for the sunshine that we've received today in the past few days. Father, be with those that have been mentioned that are sick, uh, Bill Steverson, uh, little Logan. Be with the doctors as they tend to them. Give them the wisdom and knowledge that they need for their care. Be with the nurses also that they can give them the proper care. Father, be with the Godsey family as they're expecting this little one. Uh, keep them safe. Keep everything healthy. Father, be with the elders and deacons of this congregation. Give them the wisdom that they need. Father, be with our leaders, local, state, and federal, as they make decisions every day. Be with us throughout the rest of this week. Bring us back again. In his name we pray. Amen.